So hello everyone, happy Friday. Um, really glad that you could make time to be with us. I hope you enjoy, enjoyed the uh, pre-workshop banter. Um, I think all of you know me, but if not, I'm Renee Nicholson and I am director of WV's Humanity Center. And I'm very, very excited to turn things over uh, to Jennifer Cerventi from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And she's gonna take us through this workshop today um, just to basically acquaint or reacquaint us with funding opportunities and it's with a special interest in digital humanities projects. So I am going to go ahead and just pass it right over to you. Thank you, Renee. Um, I am Jennifer Cerventi with the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm in the Office of Digital Humanities, but I have been with the NEH for I'm approaching my 27th year, actually, and I have spent time in the Division of Research Programs, the Division of Education Programs, and now the Office of Digital Humanities. But before we launch into our, our presentation and really our discussion, I want to sort of take this opportunity to thank Renee um, and her colleague Rhonda Raymond from West Virginia University um, for sort of inviting us to, to present today. But I also want to thank um, uh, I, I want to call them my colleagues, my colleagues from the West Virginia Humanities Council, Eric Wagner and Aaron Reby. It's, it's a special treat to, to have um, representatives from the West Virginia Humanities Council joining us um, today. It is not always the case that councils are able to participate, but I sent a, a note and heard back immediately that they would be pleased to join us. So I think that speaks to sort of the role that the State Humanities Council sort of envisions um, uh, envisions their role um, in, in this space and, and how they want to work with you on their projects. Um, so there will be time and you'll, you'll be able to hear from Aaron sort of um, partway through the presentation as well. But um, let's get started. So you'll notice, in fact, that I've changed the title a little bit. And for those of you who are um, who joined the meeting a little bit early, I added the why. We are the National Album for the Humanities. The humanities are about the why. Um, and um, so I, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of why the NEH and um, uh, why why this event. So we're going to just for to remind everyone, sort of we're going to sort of uh, see what the, the definition that of the humanities that the NEH uses and to remind folks how capacious that definition is. We're gonna talk a little bit about the NEH. We're gonna, the heart of the, the presentation though is the review of the funding opportunities. And that includes from the NEH, but also from the West Virginia Humanities Council. We're going to also talk a little bit about the NEH review process. And then we're gonna end with where to find more information. Um, just a, a, some, a few things. You could certainly ask questions in the chat panel at, at any time. Um, and we'll, we'll save them to the end, but if something occurs to you during when, when either I'm speaking or when Aaron is speaking, feel free to, to pop it into the chat. Um, and so we have a record of it and we can make sure we respond to it. We'll have contact information um, on the final slide that we'll keep up during the question and answer period. And then um, I will send Renee the slides with all of the links. Um, uh, so that you'll have them after the webinar. Um, it's I didn't want to put some really ugly links into uh, slides. That that doesn't always work well. So um, I, I did want to, um, there's there's a couple of ugly links in the slides, but I did want to um, reassure you that um, you can find all of these links on the NEH website as well. So let's start with the why. And here is the report on the Commission on the Humanities, um, which was uh, prepared in 1964. Um, it's in some ways are the impetus for the founding of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It, it is the report that led Congress to um, sort of pass the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act, which um, uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed in 1965. It sort of situates sort of our work with and against um, and amongst um, sort of the National Science Foundation, but also our sister agency, the National Endowment for the Arts. It is quite prescient though, if you sort of go back and take a look at it. Um, there was another uh, Commission on the Humanities in the, the 80s um, that sort of revisited this, um, these issues. Um, and there's been a, a more recent one that looked at um, the humanities and STEM as well, um, branches from the same uh, tree. Um, all sort of speak to and position sort of the humanities in the broader conversations that are happening. And um, I'm in the Office of Digital Humanities. We do work across the missions of the agency, but we also work 
with other funders, whether it be with here, here in the United States with the National Institutes of Health, National Library of Medicine, or the National Science Foundation, but our funders outside of the United States as well that also support the humanities. Because as we say at the NEH, and um, Aaron, I don't know if you say this at, at, at the West Virginia Humanities Council as well, but the humanities know no boundaries, um, whether it be time, or space or sort of the audiences that you're speaking to. So we, we do try to keep that in mind. I um, have tried to pull some examples that really sort of um, demonstrate the breadth of what the NEH funds as well. So um, I, I want to reassure you that if you're in the humanities, there's probably a place for you somewhere in the NEH or somewhere at one of our st uh, the state councils. Um, and our goal is really to help you find that place within the NEH as well. So. When I say, if you're in the humanities, this is the, the guiding definition that we have. And I wanted to pull out a couple of things to point to. Um, so to, of course it includes literature, history, philosophy, um, but it also includes the history, criticism and theory of the arts, as well as um, those aspects of the social sciences which have humanistic content and employ humanistic methods. Um, so very broad, very capacious, but those sort of edge spaces, um, it's always worth having a conversation about if your project fits within sort of the scope of what NEH does, or even if you're in the humanities, you may be doing a project that might be more appropriately funded by the National Science Foundation or the National Noun for the Arts, and that's okay. Just as we here at the NEH, um, and particularly in the Office of Digital Humanities, sometimes fund computer scientists or information scientists because their project is in the humanities, we are interested in sort of, uh, ensuring that projects find their right home, um, whether it be within the NEH or another funding body. But um, we are primarily interested, and we have to because of our um, guiding legislation, sort of fund projects within sort of the humanities. But just to sort of give you a sense, I, I mentioned that 1965 was when um, uh, the NEH got underway. 67,000 projects, and that doesn't even count sort of all the many, many thousands of projects that our state humanities councils have supported over the years. And so folks, when folks say, oh, I don't know if um, this NEH, what have they done for me lately? Um, and, I, and I often say, well, um, have you watched a documentary on PBS? Um, you might be the case that you were taught by a teacher who attended an NEH summer seminar or institute and decided to stay in the classroom energized um, and um, uh, excited to teach the new content that, that he or she uh, learned during that, uh, that opportunity. Perhaps you've um, done some genealogical research using digitized resources made available through our Division of Preservation and Access. Um, there are ways sort of both very public but also very quietly that the NEH sort of has reached all Americans. And we want you to sort of feel that. And when you're sort of making the case, you're, you, those of you who are in the humanities, um, uh, sort of making the case for the importance of what you're doing, you can take a look at the projects that the NEH have funded over the years to really um, sort of bolster your, your arguments as well. There, there is something for everyone from a very um, scholarly uh, monograph to a very, um, public um, and accessible museum exhibition um, all fall within the sort of the, the home and the um, umbrella of what NEH can fund. But we're going to sort of talk about um, sort of our grant programs. That's what you're here for. Um, you want to know sort of where you might fit. Um, and one way to think about the NEH is through our grant um, programs and our divisions and offices. We have seven of them. We're going to focus primarily, though, on four of them today including the research uh, programs division, my home, the Office of Digital Humanities, the Education Programs Division. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Challenge Grant Program, if only to sort of wet your whistle um, with that. And then, of course, we're going to have an opportunity um, to hear from Aaron about um, the West Virginia Humanities Council as well. So let's dive right in. Um, I, I did sort of uh, speak with uh, uh, Renee as we were planning this and, and mentioned that um, I really wanted to do, because I'm with the Office of Digital Humanities, is really focus on sort of the range of funding opportunities that sort of are digitally inflected, because the Office of Digital Humanities is not the only place that this uh, sort of work is supported. So here's one of those somewhat long and ugly um, uh, uh, 
uh, web links and you'll be able to find this um, uh, when I send you the, the slide deck, but we have actually put together a blog post. My colleague has put together a blog post to help folks with a digital project sort of navigate the range of opportunities that are available. Um, and I'll, I'll dive a bit more deeply into a number of them. I'm not gonna talk about all of them um, because there are in fact so many that can support digital projects. Um, the Office of Digital Humanities might be the first place that you start, but I often have conversations where um, uh, I end up, after listening to uh, someone, I end up saying, actually, I think your project is better suited for our Division of Preservation and Access or our Division of Public Programs, or have you spoken to your State Humanities Council? Um, so uh, uh, this is a good starting point. We, we have the word digital in our title, so many folks obviously start with us, and that is okay, but you may not end up with us, and um, that's okay too. But let's move on to the Division of Research Program, since I know we have some members of the faculty and um, the Humanities uh, Institute at um, West Virginia University um, does a lot of uh, work in supporting sort of the research needs of, of many of their faculty. And frankly, when many folks, uh, when, at least when many uh, faculty say, oh, I have an NEH, what they mean actually is they have an NEH fellowship. They, are, um, they have funds for research and writing. Um, and that's really important to visit archives, to, to build out time for the research and writing, because let's be honest, that sort of research undergirds a lot of the other work that happens in the humanities. Um, it monographs lead to films, monographs lead to uh, museum exhibitions. It actually improves teaching as well. So one way to think about the division of research programs is the type of um, funding opportunities they have. We have both grants for individuals, and this is sort of a nice list of them. There's a range of different ones here, um, as well as grants for institutions. But for our grants for inst um, individuals, I do want to reassure folks that um, as you think about fellowships, um, and we, we really um, are cognizant of the fact that the NEH fellowships programs funds a, a really wide range of types of, of research and um, into a wide range of subjects. And in fact, here's one, a recent one from West Virginia University, um, funded in 2019. Um, but look at the title, Sierra Leone's History of the Epidemics. Um, could not be more important these days as we think about sort of the history of, of um, health across the country. Um, but also provides that historical context, but needing time for, for research and writing. Um, so as we uh, uh, remind yourself that this, this research that is done in earlier times becomes ever more important, depending on sort of what's happening sort of currently. And sometimes we can predict it and sometimes we can't, but we still need to be able to support that sort of work. And it is often through the fellowships um, that that sort of work is supported. And you also want to point out another one, um, also at West Virginia University, funded in 2017. Um, this is one that is one of those ones that's uh, the history and criticisms of the arts. Um, and quite an, an, an important topic, um, obviously, but from sort of this record in a database comes this work. Um, and it's really gratifying to see sort of the work that is funded sort of end up in, in a, a volume that's available now. Um, uh, in your library or for use in your classroom, um, just for um, to enjoy reading as well. Very scholarly, but also very accessible at the same time and of interest to a wide range of, uh, of folks. I also did want to point out um, that we are increasingly seeing projects that are digital first or digital only. And that's even in the fellowships program. There are increasingly um, available platforms that allow scholars to make their work available, peer review forms. This is one that was funded at the uh, Jonathan Stone is at the University of Utah. It's a sound studies project. So having a, uh, a digital monograph where you can incorporate sound is incredibly important to make the arguments that he wants to make. So um, this is an example of the type of of digital work that can be supported through a fellowships program. So I don't want you to think, oh, um, I'm, I'm a scholar doing digital work, but I don't see that hat being funded in the fellowships program. It's not a preponderance of what we do now, but it is possible and it is um, appropriate. And if that's the type of work that you need to do, it can be supported in the fellowships program. 
But we also have in our division of research programs, um, opportunities for collaborative work, for teamwork. And that's supported through awards via institution. So your institution applies for the team because they're gonna have to manage a lot of moving parts. And that's why we call them grants for institutions. And that includes the collaborative research program, which um, actually has a specific stream on scholarly digital projects um, under that opportunity. It also has, as I mentioned, sort of the humanities know no boundaries. If you're doing work with um, some of your colleagues outside of the United States, they have a planning for international collaboration um, opportunity as well. Of course, the scholarly editions and translations, some of our sort of really sort of foundational work at the NEH. It's our founding era papers are funded through this program, but also um, uh, the, the work of Verde, the um, uh, song, uh, editions of, of, of song and music. Um, also, um, we, we see translations. If you are um, translating work um, and building that sort of scholarly apparatus around it to make available the, the works, um, uh, that weren't in English now, but should be made available to um, an American audience. We have our translations program. And one of our newest sort of um, opportunities in the division of research programs is uh, archaeological and ethnographic field research program. For those of you who have sort of are, have been part of the NEH family for a long time, know that the archaeology program used to be subsumed under the um, collaborative research program. We've pulled it out, but we've also broadened it to make sure that folks know that um, ethnographic field research, including oral histories and other sort of humanistic social sciences can be supported through this funding stream. But it really is sort of um, field work with an eye towards sort of an interpretive um, project at the end of it. So I wanna make sure if you sort of were familiar with what NEH used to fund five years ago, come back and didn't see yourself, come back to the NEH there might be something now in the Division of Research Programs um, through this the separate uh, funding opportunity that, that might speak to your particular needs for the state of your research project. So um, that's the research uh, division. Um, and here's an example of, of one of those scholarly editions that we um, talked about. Um, this is a, an open access digital edition, so it speaks to sort of what I'm interested in, um, in particular sort of scholarly communications. But I love that this is um, uh, for a project that um, is bringing a, a somewhat narrow topic, but of probably if the more people learn about it, the more interested they would be in it. And having an open access digital edition makes that increasingly available. Um, so a team of scholars led um, by the University of, of Missouri, but also including scholars from outside of that particular institution is making available these materials. What I particularly like about it is this website is actually built on the Scalar platform, which is funded by my office, sort of that infrastructure. So it's a, a nice way to sort of see how the NEH funding opportunities support each other. The work of my division, my office, undergirds the work that then can be done in the office uh, and the division of research programs. We don't always have to reinvent the wheel. That's not a good use of your tax dollars as well. But it's a really wonderful site. In preparation for this, I had an opportunity to delve deeply into this website and I enjoyed learning about something I didn't know very much about. And I think that's the, the brilliance of what NEH does is you're always introduced to things you didn't know about, but now you do. So let's move to my office then. I, I spoke about sort of the, the Scalar platform that, that we supported, that, that scholarly publishing platform. But we, we are the office, we work across the missions of the, the NEH, as I, I, I noted, we do projects that sort of work well with sort of the needs of the Division of Research Programs, but also um, some work that undergirds what eventually might become a public um, uh, programs project or uh, one that fits, uh, that eventually will fit in the Division of, of Education Programs. Um, but we are sort of interested in exploring sort of the introduction and spread of digital technology. And that's pretty broad. Since its beginnings, the NEH um, has supported work in what might have been called humanities computing at the time is now called the digital humanities. Some of the first awards that we made were in that space. But there was a moment um, about uh, 16 years ago that the NEH sort of looked around and said, you know, we, we actually do need a dedicated office. Um, there's so much happening. We need sort of an office that um, sort of help is the glue between, um, at least in this space. And um, as some of you may have heard uh, while we were talking before the presentation, I'm a military brat. Um, 
Uh, my dad is a, an Air Force intelligence officer, and he likens the work of the Office of the Digital Humanities to skunk works um, that um, are often in um, uh, that the military uses. And I do have to correct him, and I said, but dad, the skunk works are secret. The work of the Office of Digital Humanities is actually, um, uh, we are forthrightly transparent as we can be. The work that we do um, is uh, supported and made available, and we're very transparent in what works and what doesn't work. And we need to have that space as well for that experimentation to try things out, to inform the field so um, that um, those who come later can build upon it. If you build open source software, can add to it. Um, can learn from what worked and doesn't work, and can actually identify, even in the projects that we fund, who wasn't at the table that needed to be at the table to expand the audiences as well. So we have a couple of, of grant programs that I wanted to highlight. Um, one that um, I think is sort of our most capacious is the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program. It can do a lot of things. Um, from early stage workshops to bring together folks who are working on a problem um, who might not really have an opportunity to speak with each other. And that might be because they're in different disciplines on their own campus and need to bring in some additional um, uh, uh, sort of advice. But it also might be that there are scholars spread across the world that um, uh, need an opportunity to speak together, to, uh, to come together and to prepare a report, a blueprint for going forward in some topic in that space. Um, we do a lot of international collaboration in this work. Um, we explore sort of computational methods and techniques um, that contribute to the humanities. But on the flip side, we also support research on digital culture from a humanistic perspective. We have to be able to do both. We are the national noun for the humanities. We, also, we have to recognize that the humanities and the expertise of humanity scholars bring a lot to the table. And if we learn nothing in this past sort of uh, 20 months of the age of misinformation, Humanities expertise needs to be at the table um, when we're designing software for use by a broad audience. Um, those folks need to sort of uh, bring their, their expertise in historical context, um, uh, ethical dimensions to the, the table. So we do um, some projects in that space as well. And we can fund it early stage projects, more mature projects, um, which is to say that if you are sort of see yourself in this space, take a look at this um, funding opportunity. Here's some examples. Um, a, a level one workshop um, at the University of Nevada, Reno on ethical visualization in the age of big data. But the, the core project that they were building off of was um, a, a digitized news, um, a newspaper collection of French newspapers. So we have the big data. The question now becomes, what do we do with it? Um, and digitized newspapers are an example of many of these digitized collections that um, we need to ask our questions about language, um, about uh, geography, about who was writing it and what can we pull from it. Another example, a level two, that's sort of that middle stage, sort of building a toolkit, but still needing time to sort of work on it, test things out, do some um, uh, uh, work with sort of the audiences. And this one is at the University of, of Richmond um, for the um, uh, uh, for visual culture, another part of what's um, sort of under the remit of, of the NEH. We also do projects that are um, going to end up with a monograph, um, but a, a really a, a monograph that needs sort of um, more time to gestate and needs sort of more, more uh, folks working on it. And then this one is from Lauren Klein at Emory University, um, her data by design project. Also, an, but an interactive history of data, data visualization. So using the tools, the platform to make the arguments that, that she is making. And finally, a um, very large scale um, project that has been going on for a while, but this is, um, uh, they were at a stage where they were ready for sort of our large scale funding. And this is the Mukatu project out of Washington State University um, for um, uh, uh, collections management for sort of indigenous cultures. What, who gets to control sort of who gets to see and use um, uh, uh, material culture um, and, um, uh, how do we bring sort of more people to the table so that they can use it for their own collections as well? We also know that in the digital humanities, folks need time to tool up. They may not have had opportunities in their own training, or they may be sort of at an early stage of their career where they really want to explore some possibilities. So we built the Institutes for Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities to provide for that professional development. And this is an example of the ones that were funded this year. 
um, uh, from scholarly publishing to public digital humanities to one that is really focused on a particular discipline, um, uh, global middle ages. Um, um, which is to say though, that if you don't see something this year, come back to us again, um, keep an eye on us. We, every year there's sort of different ones available. Um, and we keep up the websites from previous ones as well. So you can dip into ones on text, text, um, textual analysis to network analysis to sound studies um, to really sort of see what they were reading, see the projects that came out of it, maybe even see a keynote address that um, was recorded. We're trying to sort of broaden the reach as to who can benefit from it. So a, a, a core group of participants to a, a broader sort of long tail for the humanities and long tail for the digital humanities as well. But let's move on to the Division of Education programs. Um, it's actually a nice segue because I spent many years in the Division of Education programs. I saw how important those programs were. And much of what I brought to the Office of Digital Humanities, I learned in the Division of Education programs. Um, and they are really interested in sort of strengthening teaching and learning in the humanities. And they do it through professional development and curriculum development programs. Um, something that I think might be of interest to sort of those of you in the audience or those of you that um, um, that work with uh, uh, colleagues is um, our humanities initiatives program. It's one of the most capacious programs that we have in that division. Um, it can um, uh, strengthen sort of existing teaching, uh, existing programs. It can develop new programs. Um, it can work with community um, groups um, to strengthen those ties between an institution and a community group. Um, I can't even make a slide that has all of the bullet points of what they can support. Um, it, it's too many, um, which is to say that it, it's worth taking a look at to see if what they're able to support is something that you're seeking support for. And a number of the projects that have been funded over the years through this program have included the development of sort of uh, digital humanities curriculum or digital adjacent curriculum, I like to say, or projects that are bringing sort of digital um, work to communities, whether through a K through 12 audience or through um, community organizations. And one of the examples that I, I really love to sort of pull out is the one that um, is actually in Washington State, but it's the Wacom Community College. And it's because it's doing so many different things. It's a curriculum development project for their own campus but they're also working with um, local tribal communities. They're also doing a professional development day for K through 12 teachers um, to integrate the, the digital story maps into their own um, lesson plans. And it's gonna be open access at the end of it, which is to say that it starts with something that's meaningful to them, the history and cultures and science of um, the Salish Sea, sort of which is where sort of the Bellingham, Washington is located. But it's thinking about the multiple audiences that would also benefit from it. And so um, certainly as, as you're thinking about sort of, we're, we do a lot on our own campus, what can we do to share that with the local community? Um, the uh, Humanities Initiatives Program might be a, a good place to start. Humanities Connections Program also um, in our Division of Education programs. Um, it's really focused on undergraduate education. So a, a much more sort of narrow um, focus in terms of audience but really um, also to encourage um, uh, applicants to think about sort of undergraduate um, education in a much broader area. What can the humanities working with STEM or business or the health sciences sort of bring to the table? We all have much to learn from each other, but on a, on a college campus, on particularly large university campuses, you don't often have an opportunity to sit and talk with your colleagues to plan for integrated courses. This is a program that um, is able to support that sort of work. So a couple of examples that I wanted to sort of bring to the table. Um, one from Newman University in Wichita, Kansas. This is sort of that emphasis on technology and human values. Um, I think that's an, an incredibly important topic and one that NEH has a really unique um, space to occupy um, as our, we use our, the power of our convening. Another one out of West Virginia Wesleyan University, sort of an interdisciplinary minor in Appalachian studies. So really building from their strengths um, and their location. And I think that's also uh, an opportunity that the um, uh, Humanities Connections can, um, can, can afford um, applicants. And of course, our summer programs, we modeled the Institutes for Advanced Topics on the Institutes program 
Um, I saw the value of it. I saw how important it was for not only the directors of these opportunities, but for the participants. Um, so when I joined the Office of Digital Humanities, one of the first programs that we sort of brought up to speed was the Institutes for Advanced Topics of the Digital Humanities. But the Institutes program can do um, a range of different things. And in fact, the last couple of years, they have really sort of modified that program to take into account sort of what we learned um, uh, from COVID, the, the value of online or hybrid opportunities, um, the value of sort of a long tail of these institutes as well. But just to, and then of course, the landmarks of American history and culture, sort of the value of your space um, and your place. Um, and what could you sort of share with a national audience? What does a teacher in California need to learn about Appalachia? What does a teacher from West Virginia need to learn about the Cold War in Southern California, for example, or Japanese internment camps in Wyoming? Um, we have much to learn about other places that sort of knit us together as a country. Um, and these are, these are opportunities to do that. Here's an example of an institute um, hosted by Shepherd University, um, uh, really sort of taking advantage of sort of the location again, um, uh, a three week summer institute. Um, you certainly don't have to do a three week one. You can host a one week one if it, if it works for you. Um, but it also, it's one that they sort of hosted a, a, a couple of times um, because the demand was so strong. But here's one that's coming up um, for college and university teachers. And I, I love this one because it is, um, Texas A&M is sort of the host, but they're actually coming to Washington DC and um, it's gonna be at Dumbart Notes. And it's gonna be hopefully next summer, knock on wood, we'll be sort of ready to host folks again. Um, but um, it's an example of a, a project where you can be the applicant, but you can have it anywhere in the United States as well. Go to where sort of the project um, you want it to be. If you wanna use sort of the, uh, the resources, if you have collaborators um, at other locations, access to, to wonderful research libraries all around the country. Um, this is an example of what might be possible, as well as the type of topics that might be possible as well. Um, let me sp speak a little bit about the Office of Challenge Grants, um, if only because all of the work that you do has to be sort of undergirded by infrastructure. And the Office of Challenge Grants is really sort of our infrastructure um, office. And they support work both at the capital project, sort of the building bricks and mortar, but also digital infrastructure. If people come to rely upon a digital project, that needs to be supported long term. And we need to figure out funding models to support that as well. Um, so if, if any of you are, um, interested in um, sort of working on this space. I know fundraising is not um, uh, everyone's favorite thing to do. Even just writing grant applications are not everyone's favorite thing to do. But if your campus is um, uh, beginning a capital campaign, or if you know an institution that is raising funds for an extension, say for a public library, make sure that the Office of Challenge Grants is part of your strategy. You're already raising money. The Office of Challenge Grant requires third-party funding um, uh, so it, it's actually, it's a lever to raise even additional funds and to broaden your base of support. Um, and certainly it can be for projects um, for digital infrastructure, such as the Humanities Commons Project, which all of you should know anyway, um, but it has been supported by um, the Office of Challenge Grants but it got its start in our Office of Digital Humanities. So another sort of um, an, uh, example of a project that begins in sort of a one area and goes um, to another space within um, NEH. But um, if nothing else, um, the end of this day, go to, uh, go to the Humanities uh, Commons website, just Google Humanities Commons, set up a profile, begin um, uh, part of this community, this network um, uh, of Humanities Scholars. You'll find your people there. I will say that. But this is also an example, this one at San Jose State, is they're establishing a digital humanities center on their campus. But something that's really special about San Jose State is their main library is also the local public library. Um, so it's gonna serve a range of different audiences. And I think that's um, really exciting as well. And now I'm actually gonna um, turn um, the, uh, my attention over to, um, or turn your attention over to Aaron actually, 
um, to really learn about the West Virginia Humanities Council. And I actually think you and West Virginia are incredibly lucky to have the council that you have. Um, and I've been at NEH for a long time. I've seen sort of the, the work of different councils and I'm, I'm always sort of impressed at sort of how the West Virginia Humanities Council can, can do the work that they do in the types of programs that they offer. It, it, they're so sort of wide ranging as well. So you will see yourself within sort of the work of the council. And Erin, if you just wanna say next, I, I will advance your slides when, um, when you're talking as well. So um, Thank you Aaron, very you're up. Much, um, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I only have really just this one slide um, as I didn't wanna take away from yours. Um, I find everything you've shared very fascinating. And enlightening for myself as well, because as you can imagine, I get questions about your grant um, all the time. <laughs> so um, I, I'm happy to be here and, and listen in on that. We have at the um, Humanities Council, our um, funding or the majority of our funding is um, from, our NE, from the NEH. Um, so much of the rules that we follow are the same um, with regard to um, what can be funded and can't be funded. But we have seven different types of grants here with varying uh, deadlines and um, match requirements and, and maximum award amounts. Uh, every January, I think it is, I um, do a brown bag lunch for the Everly College at WVU where we talk about grants. Uh, last year it was, or this past year, it was certainly um, virtual, so we didn't get to snack on anything there <laughs> either. But um, this worked out well too. I, I find that when I'm talking with um, faculty, um, the most um, interest we get is for our fellowship grants and um, probably our major and, and mini grants. And our, our fellowships don't compare to NEH's fellowships and the amount of um, the award. However, we find that they're very popular um, and they're very popular with WVU faculty. They offer up to $3,000 and the deadline's coming up February 1st. Um, our requirement is that only that the topic is in the humanities and the individual either lives or works in West Virginia. And um, they can be any, any sort of topic. It doesn't have to be a West Virginia topic. We, um, what else can I say about our fellowships? They're used for um, uh, in-depth research and writing in a humanities topic. So um, if it's some sort of you know, exhibit, I will usually um, advise that the um, individual get a sponsor and um, apply through a mini grant or major grant. I shouldn't say get a sponsor because we don't allow physical sponsors, but I would say go through the university to um, apply for a mini or major grant. And our mini or major grants, um, the only dif real difference is that one is mini and one is, so it offers up to $1,500 and our major grants offer up to $20,000. And these can be for any type of projects um, that doesn't, that don't fit into the one, one of the other um, categories. So we do, for major grants, we do a lot of lecture series, large exhibits. Um, we do like Shakespeare festivals. We do a uh, humanities festival at like Contemporary American Theater Festival. Uh, Eric, can you think of any other types of projects we do? Our mini grants are maybe used for one lecture um, or one present, you know, you're bringing in one scholar for just one talk or our mini grants are often used for planning purposes, things like that. And uh, media grants is probably where, um, in most cases where like digital humanities would fall, um, not all cases, um, but in many cases. So we do for our media grants, we do a lot of, um, a lot of documentaries actually, mm -hmm. but we do um, websites and um, GIS projects. We do um, so lots of podcasts as well. So um, those have become pretty popular. The difference between you know media grants and our major grants is that it, why they're separate is because our media grants go through an extra um, layer of review, which includes um, we have three we hire three media experts who also have some sort of background in the humanities to review those um, technical aspects of the project. So, you know, is um, the, the lighting and the, and the sound and do, do they have appropriate staff to handle, you know, what, what they're doing. So uh, the other popular one out of WVU recently has been our teacher institute grants. And those have to come through basically the colleges and universities uh, in West Virginia. And we've um, had a couple of those 
over um the, we we get usually three to five applications for teacher institute grants every year we used to say it had to be two weeks um that's not really the case anymore and over the past couple of years these have been um almost all virtual um institutes which allows the organizations to reach a lot more um, mm -hmm. people. We do require, you know, that the university offers some sort of credit, either a graduate credit or credit that will lead towards, you know, continuing education requirements. And another popular one uh, is our travel assistant grants, which have not been popular during the pandemic. I wonder why, but we <laughs> offer up to $500 um for for travel and these are quite popular for you know going to a conference or something like that where you're presenting in the humanities so Aaron I have to say um the range of topics or a range of opportunities offered by the West Virginia Humanities Council is amazing um yeah. and really sort of I think builds sort of the cohort of folks who can use a say a media um award that then positions them well to apply to NEH um, later. Right. You need to, in some ways, build track records um, to be successful at NEH, and we'll sort of talk a little bit about that. But using the range of opportunities right. that the, that your council adds um, offers is amazing. And we um, hear that a lot, and I'm seeing a couple of the um, grants that you put up from West Virginia are actually ones that I recognize from here. For example, Travis received yes. a small fellowship grant from us and then went on very excitingly to receive a fellowship from um, the NEH, and there was another one in there as well. Um, we get that a lot, yeah. yeah. So it's very exciting for us. Um, and we do know, um, you know, our fellowships, I think, are pretty unique. Um, as are. many other councils don't offer them. We find them um, pretty important though. You know, um, we, we get to show that we're supporting the, this very diverse uh, work, mm -hmm. whether, you know, it's Nashville cats or sausage making in rural West Virginia. Um, you know, it's all, it's all important um, work that we want to support and the council gets our name on it so that people know mm -hmm. that we're out there supporting this type of thing. And it is not uncommon. I'm a, um, certainly in this last 18 months, I've watched a lot of documentaries and I always stick around for the credits. It's not uncommon to see sort of a state council and an NEH name on it, for example. Documentaries are expensive to make and they take oh, yeah. a long time to make. And sometimes you need to sort of have funding at different stages as well. And you have to oh, yeah. cobble together funding. Um, and the same is true, I would imagine, for radio programs as well. Oh, so, yeah. um, yep. Aaron, so having this range add that I didn't touch on. Uh, I would only in, in response to, uh, to pick up on both your and Jennifer's uh, points. What we said about the staggering or the stepping stone approach to grant making also works for our mini grants and major grants. Mini grants are very useful if you're trying to pilot, if you have an idea for a series that you want to pilot one event or one sort of localized span of time, a series of events. And then by the time it comes to apply for the major grant, you the institution has a track record. You know, we piloted this last year with a mini grant that did very well. And, um, the, I will say our program committee, which is uh, the body that reviews grants, which is made up of half board membership and half publicly elected uh, humanists, <clears throat> excuse me, always, uh, they, they do a great job at tracking the progress of various types of grant applications. Uh, we always look at that very closely. So it can be a very strategically useful approach to take, to pilot one and then go to the major grant later on. And Aaron and Eric, um, a number of the programs at NEH, you can, depending on sort of the design of the project, um, can support students as members of the team. Is that the case with some of these um, opportunities as well? Or are there any restrictions on students as participants or receiving funding if they're an in integral part of the, the project? Um, um, no, we, we don't have, um, we actually encourage that. The oh, that's great. Way, the, the only time, um, we can't pay for regular salary. So people that are gonna be, people that will be paid whether the grant happens or not. So if it's a graduate assistant, we couldn't pay part of their salary, but it can be certainly used as match. And we certainly encourage them to be um, in, included in the project. We do have um, several projects that will apply um, to be able to hire a student as part of it. So if they're hired, just if the project happens, and, and certainly we like to see that as well. Of course, we do require a humanities scholar to be involved in, in the grants. Um, so the students generally would be working under somebody else or with somebody else who would be considered a scholar. And for us, you know, scholar doesn't always mean academic credentials, but it may be somebody, you know, um, a practitioner of the 
um, of, of the skill or, or something like that, who, who have established um, expertise through publications or work um, experience. And I think that's incredibly important, actually, to give students an opportunity to work on a humanities project. A, it introduces them to how diff how challenging humanities work is. It's it's um, sometimes it's not straightforward, and that's great. It gives them um, experiences they can act, even if they don't stay in the humanities. They have worked on a humanities project. I want to have more accountants in the world who've worked on humanities projects. I think that's important. I want more lawyers to have worked, but it also sort of introduces them to the importance of working on collaborative teams. It's something they can put on their resume. So certainly in the digital humanities, we have a lot of of um, projects that we support that include um, both undergraduates as well as graduate students um, as not only coders, but as community project managers. There's a lot of different roles that um, folks can play in these large scale collaborative projects. Um, and I'm glad to hear that um, students, depending on the, the project, and it's probably wanna check with you before they um, build it out, but are, are, can be an, an, an important member of the team, so. That's great. And that, that's true for some of the, the programs at NEH as well. So I think on the next slide, we just have my contact information. That's right. That's right. Um, so if anybody, um, the process in West Virginia is supposed to go where you contact me first before starting the application. That doesn't always happen. I highly encourage it um, because at the end of every, every initial contact phone call, I always say, I would be happy to review a draft application at any time. Um, and I really encourage that because those are tend to be the applications that are uh, funded more often than the ones that come in cold. Um, and that's only not that those other projects aren't good. It's just that I'm catching things in the budget that you might not catch or, or, or mm -hmm. be able to give pointers on other things. So I encourage you to um, give me a call or check out our website, um, pop me an email. And, you know, during this whole pandemic, everybody out there in the world also has my cell phone <laughs> number and I'm willing to go there too. <laughs> so, we're pretty um, approachable and um, it, it, we're easy to reach here. So I encourage everyone to reach out. Erin, thank you so much um, for- Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Oh no, it was wonderful to have you and Eric sort of um, get back to, to me and, and be part of this conversation. I often think that if there's not something now that um, um, folks in this session need, at least they know in the future sort of where to go. Um, it's establishing sort of um, sort of networks and, and names. And to remind folks that there are, people talk about faceless bureaucrats, you know, administrators. We, A, we now have faces, but we also really wanna, we believe in the work that you all do. Um, uh, and we wanna be able to support you in that. Um, and so we want you to, to feel like um, that you can come to us. I certainly say at the NEH, I work for you. Um, we are a taxpayer funded agency. So um, you should expect to be able to, to, um, to reach out and, and talk with us about your project ideas. So you have a project idea. Hopefully we've sparked something um, in, in this presentation. Now, what do you do? Um, well, um, you go to the NEH website neh.gov. You also maybe go to the West Virginia uh, Humanities uh, Council website as well. But th when you go to the NEH's website, this is sort of what you see. And in fact, we just announced um, the ARP relief funding. And um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that one of the projects that I am now the program officer for um, is in West Virginia. Um, it's the Arthur Dale um, site. Um, and as someone who um, has Eleanor Roosevelt as one of my personal heroes. I'm really excited. I was excited to learn about her connections um, to the site as well. Um, but what we want you to do sort of, now I'm gonna sort of help you navigate the NEH website. Although those of you who are sort of um, on your own site can sort of pull up neh.gov and sort of follow along as well. But on the NEH website at the very top, you'll always see grants. It's sort of at the very top on the right-hand side. It's sort of the, the non-floating menu. When you click on that, this is what you get. Um, I wanted to call your attention to a few things on this page. There's a lot going on here. When I pointed out those summer institutes for, um, uh, for professional development, both in the education division and in the Office of Digital Humanities, here's a link to all the opportunities in which we link out to the, um, the host institutions that often have, that have their own application process. But this is sort of a good list to start with. This is also where you can search all of the grant programs that we offer at NEH, and there's a lot of them, frankly. Many of the entries that I pointed out, the, the examples that I showed you, 
were entries from our database of funded projects. Um, they don't have a website yet or they never will. Um, so the only um, uh, examples that I have are from that um, database of funded projects. But if you click on that link, search all past awards, that'll take you to our database of funded projects, which will look like this. Um, and it's where you can actually um, search to see who's been doing work in West Virginia, but it's also a great place to see who's doing work in sort of your academic area of interest. If you're looking to find sort of partners or collaborators, if you're looking to see who's already done work in this space. Um, if you want to read a white paper from a previously funded digital humanities project, often the, the final report, which talks about what worked and what didn't work. That's another sort of important res, um, resource. If you're doing it, uh, a literary, a bibliography or an environmental scan for an application and you wanna see what NEH is funded in this space, use this database of funded projects. Um, a couple of things that I wanna call your attention to are down at the bottom, um, that advanced search option. You can sort of pull up um, all sort of all of the books that we have funded over the years. You can sort of drill down a little bit further all of the, um, American um, Rescue Plan awards that have been made or are being made right now. There's a, a way of sort of doing more granular searches under that advanced search option. It's a little bit sort of buried, so I wanted to make sure you saw that um, down there. So we're going, we're back to the grants page and we're back to sort of, we're gonna click on search all grant programs um, in which you'll get sort of a list of, of the different ones that we talked about. And you say, hmm, I really like that Digital Humanities Advancement Grant program. I'm gonna click on that. And this is what you'll get. Um, this is a, a, what I um, call the landing page. We also call it the program resource page. Every single um, funding opportunity at NEH offers this. Um, so um, it's a really a great introduction. And as you're sort of making lists of which pro programs might fund which activities of my project, this is a great place to start. You'll see sort of if, a, if um, that particular program reads a draft, It'll tell you the application deadline. It'll also tell you when um, the project start dates can be. And that's really important as you schedule out sort of uh, your project. You don't wanna, um, you wanna make sure that you're applying for funds when you need it as well. The, the, uh, the grant review process can take a long time. Um, so start thinking about sort of how you sort of schedule out your activities as well. If you scroll down on this page, these pages are, are pretty long. You'll also see sort of that, that part on the, the right-hand side sort of follows you down, but you'll also see um, every time we update it, we include a sort of a what's new. And in, in the case of the Office of Digital Humanities and this particular program, we just raise the funding levels. Um, it's also where you'll see sort of what we call the notice of funding opportunity. And that's the official application guidelines. What we, we used to actually call them guidelines. They're now called the notice of funding opportunity. It'll give you, this is what you need to have to apply to that particular program. Use your skills as a humanities scholar to read that, that notice of funding opportunity really carefully. It can be a little bit complicated. Navigating federal funding opportunities can be um, sort of overwhelming sometimes. Spend some time with it. Get out your highlighters, get out your virtual highlighters. Um, make notes of what can be funded for that particular program. Also make notes of what can't be funded from that particular program. Um, get a sense of the types of activities that have been supported. But also as you go back to this program resource page, take a look at the recent awards in this particular program. Take a list, look at the um, frequently asked questions. If you scroll down further, every program has sample application narratives for recommended or funded projects. It also will give you a sense of sort of what needs to go into a successful application. Um, used to have to ask for those sample applications when I first started at the NEH and only those in the know knew to ask. Well, now of course that we have a website, you don't need to be in the know to ask, you can just have. Um, and I think that's really important too. And many programs offer webinars and that'll be, that are really a deep dive into that particular program. And in fact, the one for this, the Digital Humanities Advancement Program was just offered yesterday by my colleague, Sheila Brennan. But we will be putting up the video of the, the webinar, we'll be putting up the slide deck, we'll be putting up a page of the links. So even if you can't attend the live event, you should always um, sort of make note and use the resources that we have made available, particularly if you're a first time applicant. These are, this, is a, this page has a wealth of resources for you. And in fact, from this page and um, because the digital humanities happens across the NEH, we've actually made sort of a, a separate resource page and includes 
sort of a, a the YouTube video of a professional development uh, webinar that my colleague Sheila did um, this uh, last summer. Um, a PDF of how to navigate also um, the different funding opportunities. There's that what grant program fits my digital project link. Um, we've also put together um, uh, some specific sort of blog posts on um, how to unpack the notice of funding opportunities, how to sort of dive deeply into the review criteria, how to write, write a successful white paper um, for, those of, for those applicants that are funded. So this is, we've pulled together all of the different resources that we've developed over the years for this page. And I think there's a lot here that even if you don't end up applying to the Office of Digital Humanities, will serve you well as you're thinking about where else at the NEH you'll find, you'll find a home for your project. But something that I always, as you're doing a deep dive, there are things that are more important than others. And of course, for each program, the evaluation criteria are the most important part. So that's why I bring this up um, as you are um, uh, reading it, because the review criteria speaks to the mission of that particular program. You should see your project being able to respond to that review criteria. Um, if you're doing a documentary film, you don't come to the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program. There'll be no sort of way for our reviewers to apply um, our review criteria for that program. You'll want to go to our media projects program in our division of public programs, for example. Um, so um, we have uh, keyed the review criteria to the different parts of the application. So our panelists will be able to sort of see how a project is responding to the review criteria. Um, the, signif the intellectual significance is always the first criteria across the agency. We are the NEH, of course. If it's not in the humanities, no matter how well a project is, is explained, we're not able to fund it, but um, make sure that you can see your project in the review criteria. Um, um, if you don't see it, let's find another program where it does fit better. A few other things, and I know many of you work with students. We always say prepare early, and you know we're all doing the best we can in this uh, second year of a pandemic. Um, we are trying to sort of meet you where you're at. But really, to the extent you can, find the right program. It's really hard when someone submits an application that is sort of minimally eligible for what we do, but would be much better suited to another place at the NEH. We can't sort of reach out to you and say, we're moving you to a different program. Once you submit an application, you're sort of stuck with the program that you submitted it to, and you won't sort of hear for many months, whereas you could have actually um, saved yourself some time and maybe um, been more successful in a different um, grant program. So find the right program before you apply. Make sure you understand how grants.gov um, works and figure out how it will work for that particular program. It varies for different programs. Individuals apply through grants.gov um, on their own. In, when you're applying for an institutional award, you need to find out who at um, on your campus will be submitting this project on your behalf. Do that early. Make sure you read those guidelines and those samples. Participate in or watch those webinars. And of course, of course, much like Erin said, she'd really like to get to folks before they apply. So would we at NEH. Um, uh, there are people at the end of those um, email addresses that are available on all of those program landing pages. I'm, I'm one of the folks to um, respond to odh at neh.gov. Um, you should absolutely not be shy about reaching out um, to get in touch with us. A few sort of more specific application advice. Um, and this is in particular for digital humanities projects. Um, many of your projects are quite technical um, and that's okay. We do fund technical projects, but help to unpack that for the different readers of, of the application. Um, some will have different types of technical expertise. Use examples um, to help um, demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. Um, try to anticipate and answer possible concerns. And that's where having someone else like an NEH program officer or um, Aaron at the West Virginia Humanities Council, um, they can bring fresh eyes and help you anticipate and respond to possible concerns in your application itself. And budgets. I know budgets are never anyone's favorite thing. And certainly when you're applying to NEH, um, our budgets are very complicated because we use the federal government wide, what's called the R&R &R budget. Um, so you'll need to consult the guidelines and the samples, know what's allowed and what isn't allowed for that particular program. And it does vary by program. Um, and so there is um, a description in the notice of funding opportunity. 
Talk to a program staff member, of course, if you have questions, but most importantly, actually talk to your sponsored research office early in the process. Do not show up the day the application is due um, with a half-formed budget and ask them to submit it to grants.gov before midnight. Um, they need to help you sort of work through your own institution's process. These you have um, policies, you need to know about your indirect cost rates and all, all of the things that go into putting together an institutional budget. That's, that may not be your expertise, but you have colleagues on your campus who that's what their expertise is. And I, um, I wanna encourage you to see them as colleagues and to work with them. They will make a much stronger application. Um, we really want the budget to match the application. It's often one thing our, our panels look very carefully at. They say, oh, they, they have such a great project, but when I look at the budget, there's only funds for one person. That's not gonna make for a successful project. So um, align your budget with your work plan, align your budget. Budgets are actually a moral document, as someone says. It really shows where the priorities are. Um, make sure your, your budget matches your, your, your application narrative as well. Now, you've submitted your application or you've had your Office of Sponsored Programs submit your application, hopefully not at midnight, the day it's due, um, just in case there's some problems. But this is what happens once it's submitted. And you, it's not a black hole, even though this is a black background. Um, we sort them into panels. We um, convene review panels of folks sort of across the country um, uh, to uh, apply that review criteria that I mentioned. The staff then assembles all of those applications together and all of those recommendations and tries to make sense of it and pull together a slate that um, sort of speaks to the priorities of the program, that um, really um, have projects that have a high chance of success as identified by the peer reviewers. And then we try to fund as many as we can with the budgets that we have. We put that slate um, before our National Council on the Humanities who makes an independent review. And then the chairman, um, by law is the person who makes the final decisions. Right now we have an acting chairman, although we are really pleased to see recently that um, uh, uh, President Biden has nominated Shelley Lowell to be uh, the new chair of the endowment. Um, she is a current council member, so we're really excited to have her. Um, her learning curve should be really uh, shallow, so she should be ready to jump right in. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have her. You can actually learn more about her on the NEH website as well. But by law, she will be the only person empowered to make the decisions. Currently, our acting chairman, Adam Wolfson, by law. So everything before that is advisory. And then you get the award notification. Um, often six to nine months later, um, hopefully you it doesn't come as a shock. You're like, oh, I forgot I had applied. Well, so you get that you get the award announcement or you get the results of your um, award. Perhaps you're funded. That's great. And I often say to my new um, awardees, congratulations, you're funded. But now you have to do what you promised you're going to do with Amer U.S. taxpayer dollars. Um, and so um, it's a, it's it's a it's an honor. It's a it's an amazing opportunity, but it's also a responsibility to manage an award as well. Um, if you're not funded. And unfortunately, given the NEH's funding situation, and I'm sure this is true with the West Virginia Humanities Council as well, we always have more excellent projects than we have funds to support. So you may have to apply three or four times. The record at NEH is six times. Um, uh, the, excuse me, the record at in the Office of Digital Humanities is six times before you're success, successful. I'm sure there's somewhere else at the NEH where someone has applied more than six times and it was perhaps successful on the seventh time should always request your reviewer comments. It's something that um, uh, uh, that we offer you. We remove the names of the peer reviewers, but the reviewer comments can be incredibly helpful. Um, something that you may have thought have been obvious was not obvious to the reviewers and may just, it may be an easy fix. Should, if you have a question though, um, if you're not sure about what this um, panelist may have meant or one panel says one thing, another panel says another, contact a program officer. We can help you sort of, make sense of those comments. And sometimes our recommendation is based on these reviewer comments, we need to find you another program at the NEH or the NEH is not the right funding body for it. Um, or this is an easy fix. You should really think about revising and resubmitting. Um, you'll have another set of uh, eyes for panelists um, for, the, for the next round um, as well. But also give yourself a little bit of time to be sad and mad that you weren't funded. Um, but don't forget to, don't, don't leave us. Um, be, um, grieve a little bit, but then come back to us. We, we want you to sort of still be part of the NEH family. And having said that though, there's 
ways of sort of staying involved with us. Um, you all are here. They are your colleagues who couldn't be here, but you also have colleagues that you may work with in the community. Make sure that um, they know what you're interested in. Make sure you know what they're interested in so you can share sort of um, and be part of that sort of network of, of, of funding um, uh, opportunities. If you see something that maybe doesn't speak to you, but may speak to one of your colleagues, let them know. If you could also follow, um, and they'll let you know as well. If, if they see something that um, may speak to you, um, that coming on board. Um, follow NEH um, on our social media accounts as well, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you are, we, we are trying to be. Um, because we do have new funding opportunities that come on board or longstanding programs change over time. And you can learn about that through our the NEH newsletters. Um, we, we, I promise we do try not to bombard you. We're, we're, with too many emails, we're not, um, uh, we, we don't spam you maybe three or four times a year for different offices and divisions, but it's a great way of sort of keeping up with what's happening at the NEH. I also wanna encourage those of you who work with students to keep an eye on the NEH website, as well as the USA Jobs site, which is the federal government's sort of employment site for internship opportunities for your students. Um, we often do have um, announced that we are accepting applications for paid internships, and we would love to have um, more students from across the country. We were able to convert a number of our internships to virtual um, during the pandemic. I don't know what that will mean going forward, um, but it is something that should be on your radar screen um, to help your students sort of think about where they fit within the humanities as well. And I'm particularly pleased that our internships are paid as well. I think that's incredibly important for broadening the participation um, within the humanities. And I talked about the newsletters. Where can you sign up for those newsletters? If you go back to that, the NEH homepage, that neh.gov, scroll down to the bottom and you'll see um, sort of all of those, uh, the different logos, but the little envelope is where you sign up for the NEH newsletters as well. And one final thing, we're always looking for reviewers. Um, if you go back to that, that grants page, um, it's where you can link to um, submit your information to being a peer reviewer. It's an incredibly important part of what we do. We rely on peer reviewers, but it is also an opportunity for you um, to get a sense of how the sausage is made with an eye toward maybe strengthening your applications going forward as well. Um, if, if you are ever interested in, in serving, um, even if you, you don't have to be within the digital humanities to serve as a peer reviewer, but um, you can submit your information that way. Um, you can um, get in touch with me um, and send me your resume and I can share it with my colleagues as well. We're just always looking for new peer reviewers. It's response, as a funding agency, it's responsible. We need to be responsible for reflecting sort of the reviews and expertise across the country. Um, but we also can't keep going back to the same folks again. And again, it's exhausting. It's, it's, uh, um, it's a job to serve as a peer reviewer and we wanna share both the opportunity, but also the responsibility to serve as a peer reviewer for NEH. Um, and hopefully you'll see it as something that you see as part of your role um, as participating in sort of the scholarly community. So here's our contact information again. That's my email address. Um, if you don't wanna to write to odh at neh.gov, which is the main um, Office of Digital Humanities um, uh, uh, email address, you can always write to me directly. If you want an introduction to someone else at the NEH, we are a small federal agency. I do know my colleagues across the agency. Erin um, has invited you to get in touch with her as well. Um, you should really feel free to, to reach out to us. I think email is a, a good first start, um, no matter what, um, no matter where you're trying to go within the NEH or within the West Virginia Humanities Council. Um, oh, I'm really thrilled to see, I don't see any questions um, uh, in there, but I'm really th thrilled to see that Arthur Dale is one of your community affiliates. Um, uh, I was thrilled to sort of be assigned that one as, as well. Um, so, um, which is to say that um, this is our presentation. It is, um, it's two o'clock now. I can stay a little bit longer if anyone needs to. Um, I can actually stop sharing um, so we can have our bigger heads on the screen. If there's anyone, I'd really like to have a, a conversation um, if anyone has any questions. Um, sometimes I'll have to say, I'll need to follow up with you personally, um, but um, some don't be shy in asking questions because you might be surprised. Some of your fellow um, colleagues may also have questions as well. Um, the same question and we can take care of it. Um, oh, thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that you were able to join us. I hope, I hope you'll, you saw something that was of use to you. 
Anyone else? I don't Eric or Aaron? Oh. Stephanie, I don't have a question, but I am going to follow up on two things that you um, that I saw in your presentation. Um, just because I know this is being recorded and I'm hoping Renee will share it somewhere. Um, you had a lot of great suggestions about the budget, which we totally echo. I always tell people that the budget should be appropriate and accurate rather than just saying, give me a thousand dollars for transportation. Tell us what you're gonna use that thousand dollars for. So as accurate as you can be. And the other thing that you didn't mention, but I did notice in there was avoid jargon, yeah. which we get quite a bit in our fellowship applications and our other applications too. Um, so I always suggest that people have somebody um, read their application from maybe another department that doesn't know exactly what they're, what they're yep. doing um, to make sure it makes sense. So I was happy to see that in there as well. Yep, I've actually seen at other campuses, they have sort of any age writing circles, um, both for the fellowships program or the summer stipends program for individuals, but even for large scale collaborative projects. Um, uh, things that are obvious to you, particularly if you've been working on something for several years now, may not be obvious to a broader audience. Um, so. That's something we often run into in uh, grant reviews, and I, I would suspect that the Humanities Center too is, I always say, you know, think in terms of, we, we have public members and board members, so think in terms of a, a group or a body of people who are at least closet humanists, Maybe their expertise may be in some other area, but they really, they come in looking to fund good programs. So help them understand that it's yeah. as clear and, and direct in everyday language as you can, yeah. what that project is all about. And certainly within the digital humanities, not all of our council members would be, our national council members um, would, would consider themselves digital humanities folks, but we still wanna fund that high level, um, very technical project. It needs to be funded. We are the right funding body. So you need to sort of um, think about how do you make the case um, both for our very technically minded panelists, they know what, they're, what you're talking about, but also the National Council on the Humanities and the chairman. Um, and you can, the best projects do that and use the samples that we have to get a sense of how those projects did that. Um, what level of detail to provide in the narrative, what level of detail to provide in the appendices. Um, it can be done. <laughs> and Erin, I just uh, wanna let you know, I will be sure to get this up where everybody can uh, access it and actually, um, you know, with our own grants coming out, I'm willing to say this is a really good presentation for you to look at for any of the grants, including the ones that, that uh, our center has. So um, just a really quick question, um, uh, really for, for uh, both Jennifer and Erin and Eric. Yeah, you know, we get a lot of people who come to the center kind of asking, you know, what makes a good project, right? Um, what are some, you know, good, I guess, rule of thumb, so when I'm working with folks around campus to kind of direct them the right way, um, you know, you've given us a ton of good ones mm -hmm. here, but, you know, somebody says, I have X project and I need some funding, and I, you know, I find myself going, okay, yes, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, if you could, could just give some good, you know, sort of broad based rules of thumb, I think that would be really useful. Well, certainly at BNEH, good projects take many forms. Um, and part of our job is to help you find the right um, funding stream for that project. But you went into the humanities because you're passionate about a particular subject or, or topic, or you want to explore a really challenging um, uh, and sometimes painful um, um, issue and bring to bear the historical and philosophical context that are necessary. That's what we do, um, whether it be in a film or a, a website or um, uh, in increasingly in a podcast um, or uh, uh, in my office, a, a sort of software, which is its own sort of uh, intellectual challenge as well. Make sure that passion comes through in your proposal. Um, uh, make sure you can make the case for significance. Why is it important to you, but why should other people care as well? Um, I spend a lot of uh, time talking with my um, extended family about what the digital humanities are. Um, and I think they got it, they have it now. Um, uh, but, and, and they see the importance of it and they understand why taxpayers should support this. Why is it, why is it not only important, but why is it important for taxpayers to support it? Um, and who else would benefit from it? Think about your audience for your project. 
who is your reader? Who is your viewer? Who is your listener? Who is your user? Um, and, and make that clear in an application as well. If you say you're doing- think, a Eric, I, I was gonna say, I think you'd echo this, but I'm gonna turn this over to you, Eric. <laughs> well, it's the, the thing we've been saying, you know, I mean, my, my previous life as an academic, you know, we always talk about, there's always the question that comes up, well, what are the humanities? What are we actually talking about when we talk about the humanities? And the, you know, one of the jokes, sort of in jokes in the academy is <laughs> it's so like it's such a broad umbrella, how do you define it? But I think the easiest way for us to think about it is it's all of the pursuits that allow us to tell the story of our human experience, what that experience was like, what our challenges were, what we valued. Um, it can be the story of our shared humanity in the broadest possible sense. It can be the story of a single small community, whether it's geographical or some other kind of index, it really is the story of the human experience. And so anything you can do in, in framing your project to indicate to us, what's the story you're telling? How, are, how is it going to be told? What are you doing to help create, preserve, and share a specific story about the human experiences? That, that's, I think, base level. Um, every project that we fund, I think, can be um, sort of filed under, under that umbrella. It's the easiest way, to, I think, to think about the, the unique position of the humanities uh, to help sustain us. I mean, look at the past couple of years, you know, people are home with it. Renee and I were talking about, you know, our, our audiences have increased uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's obvious to me that people don't find the humanities a luxury when they mm -hmm. really begin to think about it. It's yeah. something that's really fundamental to our, our sense of continuity and connection and survival. So that, I, I, that story for us is, is bulls. Yeah, I would completely agree. And if you're doing a project um, for teachers, if you're doing a project um, uh, with a community organization, include them in the project, um, in the digital humanities, um, and, and more in the public humanities. It's not, I'm not doing it for them, I'm doing it with them. They bring um, expertise to bear. They should be um, part of the planning process as well. They should be members of the advisory board. Um, they want to see themselves in this work as well. They they bring much to bear. Um, it, it's a, 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 an opportunity. Use our funding to do things that normally wouldn't happen, to bring together people who normally wouldn't come together. In the Office of Digital Humanities, that is often librarians working with computer scientists, working with um, historians or philosophers. That's that's a good use of dollars um, to, to spark that conversation that then leads to something. Um, for building software for use by humanity scholars or by the general public, um, those folks should be represented in the building process as well. I think that's all incredibly useful. So thank you very much for sharing all that. And um, you know, this is coming at the perfect time because my newsletter comes out on Monday. So there will be a, a, a link to this for folks. Um, uh, just want to make sure for those who are still here, you guys have been awesome, you know, hanging out. Yeah, thanks for sticking um, with us on a Friday. <laughs> yeah, um, but I did want to make sure there weren't any other questions before I, thanks, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I always love when the thumbs up comes up or the, or the clapping or the whatever. <laughs> Uh, it, it does make you feel, uh, uh, yes, Stacy, Colleen gets us, yes. So, um, but I just wanted to make sure any other things before I turn the recording off. And I just really want to thank you all for sharing your knowledge with us. This is incredibly helpful, I think, to our campus community and beyond. So, we, are, we, are, we were excited to get the, um, we put out the call. We we're excited to get a response, an invitation, really, to host one of these. Um, I think it speaks to how you're positioning the work of, of the Institute and within the campus as well to be a gathering place for, for this sort of work. And we do, really do appreciate um, um, allowing us to come and speak with you all. So and it was a good opportunity to meet Aaron and Eric, which maybe one day I'll meet in person. Um. <laughs> Let us all hope. <laughs> All right, Thank I'm going to go ahead and, and take the recording off. Um, there we go.